Good morning, everyone. My name is Richard Sloma. Welcome to today's New York State Archives presentation of Introduction to Managing Audiovisual Records. Today's presenters are Vincent Camisso and Sarah Derling. The session is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box to the right of your screen and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. And now I will turn it over to Vincent Camisso. Thank you, Rich. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep, I hear you loud and clear. Awesome. So my name is uh, Vincent Camisso. I work in the scheduling and state agency services unit here at the State Archives. It's part of government record services. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, our unit schedule state agency records to determine the minimal amount of time they must be retained. We also help schedule the local government records. For those of you who have the LGS-1, you'll be familiar with us indirectly. Uh, related to this, our unit is responsible for appraising records to determine if they should be made archival. And if they're archival, then transferred to the state archives for permanent safekeeping. And finally, our unit provides records management advice, hence why we're here today doing this and guidance to state agencies, but we also um, assist with local governments sometimes as well. Uh, my co-presenter is Sarah Derling. Sarah? Maybe, Sarah, you may be muted. At, uh... I'm thinking. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious, I was. And I had such a good role going. Hi, folks. <laughs> I am so sorry about that. Uh, my name is Sarah Drilling. I am a records advisory officer covering education institutions in the local government services unit. Um, I've been to the archives for a number of years now and previously worked in state agency services. Um, and really look forward to talking to you about this topic. Okay, everyone, let me just thank Rich for helping us to put this together. He's responsible for the webinar gold you're hearing today. But outside our window right now, or at least my window, there's all kinds of construction and renovation going on. So if you hear loud banging, I apologize. I have no control over it. So we've introduced ourselves. Um, in terms of you out there who are listening, uh, you're likely to be from local government, uh, state agency or from a non-governmental cultural institution. And we want you to walk away from today's presentation having a basic but high level understanding of audiovisual records and how to manage them. Um, as, you know, as part of that, while there's some technical terms you'll hear, you won't be overwhelmed with technical details. Believe me, that's, that wasn't what we're looking for anyway. Um, how applicable the information we're providing today uh, is for you will depend upon your institution and the kind of records you manage. Some of you may not even have AV materials and are just curious to to learn more about them. Um, but whether you have lots lots of AV materials or none at all, uh, this presentation will help uh, you to further develop your thinking and understanding about records management, and that's a, a good thing. Uh, and you know what we're what we're looking to do today is, and we're going to talk more in depth about this in a, in a moment, but. Um, we're going to have a discussion here of what AV records are, uh, including an overview of the forms that they take. And we have to keep in mind that before we manage these things, we need to understand what we're actually dealing with. Um, after that, we'll talk about how to best manage AV records, or at least do a better job. It's not easy all the time. Uh, followed by a recap and a question and answer session at the end. So, a little more in depth here about our purposes. Uh, there's several reasons why we wanted to put this presentation together today. Um, uh, first, in general, when people think of records management, the first thing that comes to mind are textual records, otherwise known as, for our purposes at least, paper. Many people uh, have training and even more have experience working first and foremost with these kinds of records. Uh, they're very familiar to us, to all of us, and they feel, they feel safe because of that. But that isn't the whole of records management. Whether we like it or not, we're all responsible for the records that are created or come into our possession during the conduct of business, regardless of format. 
So the first goal is to understand that AV materials can be records and that we're all responsible for them just like anything else. Second goal, number two. As I said just a little while ago, AV records need to be managed just like everything else does. And while we want you to have an appreciation for their distinctiveness, we want you to learn more uh, about how to how to think and manage them at a high level. So the goal today is to, as I said before, not come away from this feeling like you need to have or be a technical expert. Uh, people with that kind of expertise are few and far between anyway, but we want you to come away with the confidence that you have a sense of the big picture and a better understanding um, so that you can you know, develop your own plan for managing your own uh, AV records. So that's the second goal. Uh, finally, and maybe this is the most important, we want to make AV materials less scary. Part of the reason why AV records sometimes seem unmanageable is because people, if they're being really honest and candid, they can't imagine managing them. They seem too strange, too difficult, too technically complex. In short, they can feel daunting. And because of this, we end up having uh, misconceptions about how best to handle them. So. You know, another goal of ours here today, and maybe the most important goal, is to demystify these records. Once we do that, we can get on to managing them. So let's define these records first. What are they? Well, they're just what they sound like, bad pun intended. They're records that incorporate either the element of sound, a visual element, or both. AV records uh, can exist in a physical format, um, they're contained in or on some kind of carrier or media that you can hold and handle, uh, like, for example, a cassette or a vinyl record or an optical disc like a CD. Or they can be non-physical, uh, meaning that they exist as digital or electronic files. You can move these around on your computer screen with your mouse or, in my case, with a trackball, but you can't pick them up and move them from one physical, physical location to the next unless they've been moved onto some kind of portable media, like a USB drive, we're all familiar with those. But we're gonna talk more about that later. Um, another distinction that's important, physical uh, audiovisual records, uh, depending upon how they were, were how they were recorded, exist in either analog or digital formats. Now, a lot of people have heard of analog because a dozen years ago or so, television switched off of analog signals, so maybe that's what people think of. But for audiovisual materials, this distinction uh, is important, but for our purposes, the the more sort of technical aspects, the complicated aspects of the distinction, they're not that significant. Um, the the difference revolves around how the sound and or visual information was recorded. Uh, if you go online, if you're so inclined, you'll see that there's a spirited debate among people who are really into analog or really into digital and about which one's better, um, at, at the risk of oversimplifying it. Analog tends to be the older stuff, and digital tends to be the newer stuff. But digital isn't even that new. Um, there were digital audio and digital video materials being produced in the 1980s. But digital gradually came to supplant and ultimately replace analog over the course of the 80s and 90s. So that by the 2000s, the aughts, analog was rapidly becoming a legacy format. Uh, while it's safe to say that uh, AV today has, uh, you know, come to be dominated by digital formats, uh, albeit no longer the physical ones quite so much, and we'll get, again, we'll get to this later. We don't want to write off analog entirely. There's a growing interest in analog formats, certainly among hobbyists, um, particularly in vinyl musical records, and many people listening today may still possess a record player and records from the before time or may have gone out and purchased one in recent years, as it's become a bit of a niche industry in its own right. Um, some people really appreciate the materiality of analog. Uh, for that matter, some of us still appreciate physical digital formats too. Uh, I don't know about you, but I want my CDs and Discman back. I want to own my own music again and be able to pop in a CD into my laptop. Uh, those days appear to be gone. But um, to the last point here, uh, as I just said, uh, AV records can also exist as non-physical digital files. And we're going to just table that for now. Uh, but I just want you to keep it in mind because Sarah's going to return to it later and walk us through. All right. So I'm feeling a little jabbed. I have a somewhat 
respectable vinyl collection myself. Um, and actually, I started out collecting 78s, which are on shellac, so, you know, nerd. Um, I like AV. It's fun. We're going to talk about different types of audiovisual materials throughout this presentation. Um, and the general categories that you're looking at when you're talking about them is going to be your audio recordings, which include those CDs, DVDs, 78 RPMs with Frank Sinatra on them, um, the MP3 files that you may have been listening to or the music you may have been streaming this morning. Video recordings or film recordings with moving images. And these may or may not have sound. You know, not everything was recorded with a soundtrack associated with it. Graphic works, which can include posters and various forms of digital art, and still images. For today's presentation, what we're really going to focus on is going to be the first two, the audio recordings and the video recordings with or without um, sound. Now, when we're talking about audio recordings, there's several kinds of things that you as a local government or state agency or even cultural institution may have on hand. Um, Meetings are one of the things that I've seen a lot of in government agencies and, and local governments. You know, meetings have been recorded on film or, um, or sorry, audio tape. Um, I've seen lots of, uh, of cassette tapes floating around with in the recording of the meeting that was going to be used for transcribing those notes and um, creating, those, creating those minutes. You may have interviews in your collection. Um, Maybe you've uh, in interviewed some staff or notable people in your community for, or, and done some oral histories to document knowledge that they have. Or if you're a school district and you've got a student news division, you know, maybe they've got a hot topic of the day that they've been interviewing students about and, and that's gone into your uh, repository of knowledge. Press conferences, often seen. You've got your independently elected official or your commissioner or somebody important within your organization out there making major announcements or responding to significant events. And you know, you're recording these to produce either a transcript or you know, depending on what the topic is, you're just you know, for posterity to preserve this for history. Same thing might go with, for speeches as well. Might as well bounce down to their world. We're kind of on the same topic. Um, public service announcements actually do turn up quite a bit in government collections, um, particularly when you're talking about the state agencies. A lot of time that they are they are going to be audio, but you also sometimes will find video ones that are that were you know put on. Oh gosh, I, the things I have seen on YouTube this past year that have come out of the Department of Health, honestly, um, <laughs> you, you'll have them in a lot of different places and used for a lot of different things. You might have audio recordings for other things like testimonies, broadcasts that you have, you know, your, your, your agency, your government has made, or, you know, musical performances. You, again, school districts, you've got this wonderful jazz band or, you know, stage choir or, you know, a fantastic drama department that it does Hello Dolly every year. And you've got a recording of that um, that you keep in your collections. This list isn't exhaustive, you know, this is just the common things that we see floating around out there, but you may have other different kinds of audio recordings and audio records in your collections. The same thing goes for video recordings. There's a lot of overlap here with regard to that, uh, with, with, re with regard to the audio recordings. Um, in many cases, video is just adding a visual component to the audio recording. Um, but there are some things that are kind of unique to video recordings as well. You've got your surveillance footage, your security footage, the hot topic of the recent, uh, recent local government conversation, which comes, to, comes out as police body and dashboard cameras. Um, you might have video recordings of utility ex inspections. You may be um, broadcasting over public television. Uh, State Ed did that for a, a lot back in the 80s and early 90s. So you may have these things in your collections as well. Again, not an exhaustive list, but you know you need to be aware of what you have and where it may be. Okay, so let's talk about the components of these physical AV records. Um, just so you understand, you know, when we use a term like cartridge or carrier or tape or film, what we're referring to, 
Uh, this, this applies particularly to analog, but can also apply to physical, um, physical digital audiovisual materials as well. What you'll notice about them is that they all have some kind of cartridge on the outside, that hard shell, which protects the tape or film layers on the inside, which, when taken together, form what you'll hear me refer to as the carrier. Obviously, things like vinyl records or optical discs like CDs, right, and the, the latter there is digital, are a little different as their insides, if you will, are the, the grooves or etchings on the disc. But the same general concept applies. There's a, there's a physical vessel for the information. And that information can only be accessed with playback equipment. And that's really important to keep in mind throughout. Um, in the image on the screen, we have a cassette tape, and the information contained on the tape can only be accessed with the appropriate playback equipment, which in this case would be a tape player of some kind. Um, haven't, haven't played a tape or listened to a tape in a, in a while, but uh, back in the day had plenty of them, as I'm sure many of you did. So, physical audio media that's analog. What are we dealing with? Um, so, we have audio cassette, which we just saw, micro cassette. I had a memory blank yesterday, and I may again today, when we were doing a dry run of this presentation about what a micro cassette, what it would be used for. And I said, what's that What's that thing that, you know, before voicemail? And I don't know if it was Richard or Sarah said, uh, an answering machine? I went, yeah, those, right? So, uh, you know, you would find them in something like that. You, you also could come across or have open reel magnetic tape or vinyl discs. These are all different kinds of analog, um, analog media. For physical video media, also analog, we have my favorite, many of you love it, the video home system, otherwise known as VHS. Um, and uh, I know people, you know, love streaming content today, and I certainly appreciate it myself, but there's days when I just want to walk around a video store, a video rental store, and see what I come across. There was something pleasing about that. I miss it. Uh, but it is strange how quickly the world has uh, changed, isn't it? Um, besides that, you have uh, umatic tapes. And those were often uh, the byproduct from uh, professional um, recordings, like by you know broadcasters and you know TV stations and, and things like that. Professional productions would would have a umatic as a byproduct. There's also Betacam, Betamax, um, open reel videotape. And uh, I just want to say a, a few words here. You see at the bottom I have film written down. Uh, it's on our, you know, super main focus today, but it, it's kind of its own animal, uh, but nonetheless falls under the analog umbrella uh, and, you know, can be silent or include sound. And for those of you in local government or elsewhere who uh, possess or have experience with microfilm, whether 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter, you have what effectively amounts to silent film, I suppose. and You'll, you also, and we'll get to this momentarily, you have more insight then into analog and its issues uh, and, and how to utilize it than, than you may think um, because my, using microfilm, microfiche, still requires playback equipment, taking care of the film. It's, there's some similarities, there's a lot of overlap. Um, you can see depicted on the screen of VHS and on the right. Um, I think that's not necessarily a, a VHS player. It's like a U-Matic or something, but you get the idea. So, all right, so Vincent was talking about the physical and analog formats. We're going to talk about the digital for a second and we're going to come back around to the digital file types that can be contained on these in the next slide. But right now, we're just going to focus on the physical media that can hold these files. So there's a lot of variety when it comes to electronic records um, and, and your audiovisual records. They can be in a lot of different places. Digital audio tape is definitely one of the places that they can be found. That's you know a tape format that will hold audio recordings. You're probably familiar with things like CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray discs. 
you know, you may still have some of them kicking around your house, um, if not your office. You can also have uh, solid state media, which is your USB drive, you know, those, those thumb drives that get pushed in, um, but also increasingly are, become, are, are being seen as your hard drives in your, com in your computers. They're not the traditional hard drives that we've always had where you've got a couple of spinning disks and one of them crashes and you go, oh no, it's terrible. Um, these are solid state media where you don't have the moving parts anymore. Also, you know, digital voice recorders, you can hit the button, start talking, you've got a bunch of data, uh, audio data on there. And everybody's favorite, and I kind of miss them, honestly, floppy disks. Now, there's some variety here in, in, in with regard to access, stability, um, current accessibility. CDs and DVDs in particular have multiple flavors. You've got CDRs and DVDRs and CD and DVDRWs, which were the writable versions and were generally considered to be less stable than a flat CD or DVD, which you couldn't write to. When it comes to most of these, the, these carriers um, or storage formats, you don't want to use these for long-term storage. Um, some of them are no longer becoming, are no longer accessible. Uh, which we'll talk about more a little bit on. And, you know, they're not as stable and secure. You want your um, digital st records, regardless of what format, whether they're audio, video, whatever, you really want them in a secure server-based format, whether that's your local area network or in the cloud. These tools, um, your CDs, your DVDs, your thumb drives, are really more ideally used to transfer your data onto it's long-term storage, which is that server environment, and can in some instances be used as backups, such as the hard drives, external hard drives, that sort of thing. When we talk about these formats, um, these are some of the things that you might find that you have in your collections, and this is by no means anywhere near the complete listing of things that you may have. Um, this is very specifically just a handful of things that we see very commonly. So you may have, when you're talking about audio files, a WAV file, that, w, that WAV file, um, waveform audio format. This is an uncompressed audio file, and they're usually fairly generously sized because they have a lot of data associated with them. You also may be very familiar with the MPEG-1 audio layer 3 format, or your MP3s, which are a compressed audio format. Um, and if you've been around for a while, you may remember downloading MP3s and you know, making that critical decision of how important the compression level was so that you, you know, how many, how many MP3s could you fit on your iPod? And how good does the audio quality really need to be? For audio, for um, video files, with or without sound, you've got a variety of things as well. You've got those moving picture expert group fours, or your MP4s, which are probably one of the more common ones that you see around today. Um, your QuickTime movies, that WMMOV, um, which, sorry, that MOV file, which, does anybody really use QuickTime anymore? That's like its last standing legacy, right? And then your Windows Media Video files, those WMVs, which also are really common. So if you see these file formats, these are your digital audiovisual file formats, and you need to start thinking about how you're going to maintain and manage these going forward. OK. So now that we've seen a variety of examples of physical AV materials, both analog and digital. Let's talk about the challenges that each of these pose. I'm going to speak to the, um, the analog um, for the most part, and Sarah's going to be speaking to the digital. So the first challenge is the fact that they're physical, right? We like that they're physical, at least I do, but that means there's more that can go wrong, and that eventually will go wrong. Um, by existing out here in the world with us, rather than you know on a hard drive or in the cloud or in the electronic ether, generally um, they get worn out and they suffer from wear and tear, and frankly from our negligence. 
Uh, this might feel uh, more obvious when you think about something that isn't made of a hard plastic, like a VHS tape or cassette, but instead something like a photograph, right? We've all seen what happens to pictures that are handled a lot, not stored properly. Perhaps they've been uh, put in those plastic sheets or left out in the, the daylight for too long in the sun. Uh, this is just as true when the physical carrier of analog or physical media for digital AV materials um, is, is what we're talking about. The material contents contained within that carrier itself, the tape or the film, also have a shelf life and degrade over time. We call this process degradation. And that happens even when they're stored under ideal conditions, which again, if we're being frank about this and candid, these conditions aren't always possible to realize, much less maintain. Uh, you know, if you've worked in small, medium-sized, or even large repositories or institutions, you know this to be the case. So we, we have to account for that. Uh, your takeaway is that physical AV doesn't last as long as you might need it to. If you're a local government or non-governmental cultural institution, that AV material could be something that's deemed archival. Same for the state agencies, frankly. frankly. Um, and that means that you have to retain it forever or as close to it as you can get. Um, you know, for the state agencies, archival records should be, um, you know, scheduled and transferred to the state archives. But not everything's been appraised or scheduled. And even if it has, it may need to be retained by your agency for some period of time before transfer, and it needs to be maintained until then. If the AV material isn't even archival but has a long retention period, local governments and state agencies, I'm looking your way, it might not even make it that long due to these challenges, uh, that the challenges that physical AV formats pose. So, preservation of physical audiovisual records is a real challenge. Uh, there's no, no sugarcoating it. Second challenge, playback technology, playback equipment. Where playback technology is concerned, the machines necessary, the equipment necessary for accessing the information that's contained within or upon these carriers, okay, they're simply not being manufactured anymore. We call this technological obsolescence. Some of you might object and say, well, uh, we have a record, we have a radio with both tape and CD players built in. We're good. I wish it were so. Last, think out a few years and several uses of the machine later. Even if the physical AV itself still seems to be fine, the machine itself could get worn out. Here's what your takeaway needs to be from this. The playback technology has a shelf life too. So the records have a shelf life. The playback technology has a shelf life. It doesn't last forever. Uh, maybe something on it breaks like the play button, for instance. You can't run down to Radio Shack to buy a new two-in-one boom box, and good luck finding the replacement parts online. In short, access will become more difficult over time for AV records that exist solely in a physical format. Sad to say it, but it's true.
like we're having a technical hiccup here. And I can hear you, Vincent. Maybe uh, function. Vincent, do you think uh, you want to um, present your side over to you? Yeah, I can take the baton in the meantime. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So, until we get that sort of worked out, uh, our apologies. But let's talk about the, you know, challenges of digital AV files. Um, these are similar, at least in their logic, to uh, the challenges that physical AV files have. So first, we have the, the issue of file degradation, um, just as was the case with the information contained on the tape or the film of physical AV records carriers. Um, digital audiovisual files can gradually degrade over time and lose their cohesiveness and integrity. Uh, I, it's easy to, to think uh, that once things have been digitized or put on a computer someplace or in the cloud, you can sort of, you know, wash your hands of it one and done, but that's not actually how it works. Um, so what you really need to know here is that audiovisual records or any records for that matter that are born digital, okay, that is they're created in a particular digital format, they never existed as analog, um, or, or digital files or anything that's been reformatted converted from analog to a digital format, or from one digital format to another, they all still will require ongoing management to ensure that the file's integrity is maintained. I'm gonna come back a little bit, uh, a little bit later to around, we're gonna come back around to this a little bit later, but um, you're, you're, you're not quite done with them. Um, beyond this, second, format obsolescence. So just like we have the technological obsolescence, Formats, Sarah alluded to it, I think, with the um, .move file. Uh, they can go by the wayside gradually or quickly. Um, so after a while, they're no longer used and, and or they might be unreadable uh, because of that. So the software that could read them isn't really in circulation anymore. Um, and you could have information trapped in there and that's a problem. Uh, so just like with um, technological obsolescence, equipment obsolescence, with physical uh, analog materials or AV playback equipment, file formats, digital files and their formats do not necessarily last forever. Um, and conversion of records into accessible, still being utilized and ideally non-proprietary formats are essential to successfully managing digital AV records and shepherding them through their life cycle. Uh, just very quickly, uh, you know, what we mean by proprietary and non-proprietary. Uh, just to borrow a definition employed by the Minnesota Historical Society, proprietary file formats are controlled and supported by just one software developer, and non-proprietary formats are uh, formats that are supported uh, by more than one developer and can be accessed with different software systems. So, um, you know, the, the latter has a, a better chance of being readable down the road. The records life cycle. So, the way to frame everything, I would say, and certainly the way that uh, we would like you to, to think about things, is in terms of this records life cycle. Records are created or received. They have a period or a phase of their life where they're active. They're being accessed regularly. They're being relied upon regularly. Um, and then they hit a point where they're inactive. They're not 
you know, they're kind of put on the shelf. They go to the land of uh, the island of misfit toys. Nobody pays attention to them quite so much anymore, but we can't do that because we have to be good records managers. Um, so they, they cycle out and eventually they get to, they've reached um, their, their, their lifespan. That is how long they need to be retained at a minimum as per retention schedule. And we have final disposition, which can either result in archiving them if they're historical records or in their destruction. Um, so during this whole time period, during this whole life cycle rather, they need to be preserved and be made accessible if need be. Um, just because they're inactive doesn't mean that you're not still responsible for them if someone has need for them, including your own agency or institution. So, Let's start at the beginning of that cycle, creation. You want to use good quality media, especially for film. Um, you you want to use uh, non-proprietary formats that aren't likely to become, uh, you know, obsolescent and sort of age out quickly. Um, it's it's important uh, for digital AV that, you know, you use media for a backup, for transfer temporary storage, um, but it's, you know, not to be used indefinitely. Um, you want to avoid the use of the proprietary um, formats or lossy compression for digital audio, audiovisual records. Um, you want to, and this is a big one that we run into when we appraise records, you want to assign meaningful labor, labels and or file names to them. It's, there's nothing worse than walking into a, into a situation where there's a box of blank CDs. What's on them? I don't know. How am I supposed to figure it out? I can't possibly, if there's dozens and dozens of them, listen to them all. It can create a real um, headache, and I'm sure some of you are nodding your heads um, in, in local government or state agencies or cultural institutions that you've had some experience of this. So you want to make sure that things are labeled, that the file names are clear. Um, if the uh, audiovisual record is highly dependent on a playback device or on a particular software application, so you playback device for analog, software application for digital to access the contents. Um, you know, it's, it's really important that you, that you have good track of what these things are. Um, if the playback device no longer exists or breaks down or the software or application becomes uh, obsolescent, you're going to need really good labels. So I just I can't stress that enough. Um, you want to put a system in place. You want to design a system that will facilitate retention and disposition of records uh, accurately and efficiently. You don't want to destroy something you're not supposed to, right? But you don't want to hang on to stuff you're not supposed to. So, you know, to do this, it could range from a simple use of a spreadsheet. I myself love Microsoft Excel. I'm relatively low, low tech personally. Um, and you could use that to track the retention and disposition of individual files. Um, you could use uh, folders and file names that include uh, dates. When you, when you name these files um, on your computer. Um, or you could have something, you know, far more complicated. Uh, there's applications that'll help you do this work. So um, in, that, in the application, you can tell it in your content management software, hey, this is how long it needs to be retained for, and it starts the clock, and it'll flag it and let you know when it's, you know, met its retention, then you decide whether or not to keep it. Um, it's really important uh, in either case that you develop good policies and procedures to manage these records, to manage their retention and disposition. So you may as well just do it from the get-go, from the moment of creation or when you receive them. All right, active records. It's important to identify and or survey the audiovisual records that you possess. You can do this at any point in the life cycle, although, uh, you know, it obviously helps like I just said, doing it from the drop, as soon as you get the records, um, keep good track of them. Um, you need to know the kinds of audiovisual records you're managing so you can prepare for down the road uh, for their uh, preserving them as needed uh, and for storing them correctly. You have to ask yourself, are they records that you're obligated to retain? Are they created by or for your government? They were created by other entities. Uh, they may not even be records, technically speaking. Um, for example, 
recordings used for training purposes, recording from a network TV broadcast. I once came across uh, a tape that someone had recorded at home and somehow made it here into the um, into our stuff of a former state archivist in the late 1980s being interviewed on, on CBS or network news. It's fun, it's nostalgic, uh, but it's it's almost certainly not a record. So that's there's no reason to, to keep that, at least from uh, a records retention standpoint. Um, so the other question you know you want to ask are there multiple copies you only need to maintain one um, so having version control having control of duplication things like this I'm going to talk more about this momentarily you want to remove digital audiovisual records uh, from media and you want to get them onto a local area network or LAN or up into the cloud right onto a server Again, media is a media like a USB, for example, or external hard drive. These are temporary storage solutions. It's better to put it on a LAN or in the cloud where backup procedures are in place. Um, your IT department, buddy up with your IT department. When I worked in the local government, our IT department was fantastic. IT departments, uh, if you if you work hand in hand with them, and I think there's probably some IT people on today, they can be just a real asset for you and, and you can work this stuff out for them. But they're regularly updating and backing up all the information that your municipality has. So they can they can help you with that and walk you through it. Um, you also uh, you know want to um, consider the creation for certain kinds of records here, uh, for meetings and hearings in particular, creation of transcripts. If you have transcripts, you can then ask the question about whether or not you need to actually retain recordings of meetings and hearings. Um, does uh, a recording need to be retained or can it be destroyed once you have that adequate substitute in an easier to maintain format? Uh, sometimes it's good to have both, but if you have that transcript or the minutes recorded, um, like you know, actually physically written down in text format, that should be good enough. Uh, so examples of meetings you know, can be destroyed after four months, so long as those minutes and transcripts have been created and are preserved. Um, it's also important to, to be able to manage audiovisual records that are related to investigation or legal files. Um, when you have really, vul and that's, that's especially important for, for state and local government, when you have really large, voluminous, or very complicated audiovisual recordings, for example, surveillance footage, body-worn cameras, dash, dash cams and police cars. It's really worth seriously considering contracting with a vendor to manage, to help you manage the records. Develop a process for, for their management uh, with periodic downloads of recordings um, and identifying and preserving files needed for investigations or legal purposes and for distributing uh, this information to the appropriate staff. Now, surveying. So you have a bunch of records and you're somewhere in the life cycle, a bunch of AV records, and you gotta figure out what's going on. The way to do it is to survey and see what you have. Um, you have to take stock. So I'm just really focusing here for illustration purposes on physical AV records. There is There are processes for doing so with digital files, but I'm just focusing here on the physical. Um, you have to ask yourself some questions and try and get some answers, um, however incomplete. Sometimes you can't get great complete information, but you do the best you can. First, what format, or if you're doing digital surveying, file types do you have? Knowing your formats and file types gives you a sense of your AV records universe. You know the lay of the land, you know what's out there. You know what to expect and you can plan accordingly. For example, you won't need a VCR to watch and review VHS tapes you don't have. Conversely, you'll probably want the ability to play CDs if you have lots of them. <clears throat> but you only find these things out if you conduct a survey. Next question, how many of each format or file type do we have? If in a survey you learn that there's, you know, four physical AV formats in your holding, but of these four, 75% of them are on some kind of a CD, that's really important information. That's suggestive of where you'll need to place most of your resources. How duplicative, how many dupes are going around the records? Are there multiple copies of each item? 
or is it more random with some kinds of things being heavily duplicated while others aren't duplicated at all? Lots of duplication will also make it seem like you have more of a certain format or file type than you actually do. It can be misleading. So it'll overinflate your count, um, and you have to be on the lookout for that too. Uh, duplication can throw you a very different kind of curveball, and I've seen this. What if the same thing is duplicated in multiple formats, right? Same recording is audio on a tape, it has audio visual on a, on a, a VHS, uh, and then there's a transcript, let's say. I'm just shooting the breeze here, but like we have all these different formats. What do we do? You're going to want to know um, the condition of each. You're going to want to know that you have these different ones because when it comes time to reformat the, the information, reformat a record, you have to pick one. Um, and depending on what you're reformatting, it's going to be more or less expensive. Depending on how it was recorded, it may have superior quality. There's, there's a lot of variables here that you have to take into account. But knowing that you have it in multiple formats, that's you would rather know that than not. Um, so that's that's the next one you have to ask. What condition are they in? The answer to this question also helps tell you about where you need to devote your resources and re where you need to devote them first. Uh, that is, this helps you to further prioritize the sequence and pace of your reformatting projects. You can't do it all at once, right? Most people don't have the money to do it. So you have to pick. You have to select. Records which are in poor condition, right, you would think that that would elevate their importance or the sense of urgency about reformatting them. But let's say they have a short retention period. Or, relatively speaking, they're less significant or important than records which are also in poor condition but which are uh, historical, archival, or have long retention periods. You need to keep that for a long time. There's a lot of factors here. Uh, where are they stored? Are they on a shelf in a storage area with random items that get hot in the summer? Or are they in an environmentally controlled environment? Are the files on a thumb drive in the top right hand drawer of your desk? Or are they stored on a municipality server or saved in the cloud by a company the local government pays each month? The answers to these questions further help you understand the bigger picture that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation uh, and the situation that you face with your AV records. How are they stored? Um, not just where they're stored, but how they stored. Again, what are the environmental conditions, like the temperature and the humidity and the lighting? Um, are the records in a darker space? Or are they on the table underneath the window that gets the most sun every day? Again, uh, I'm sure people have seen these kinds of situations. Are they housed appropriately in the right um, storage containers? Or are they just loose and scattered about on a table in some room? How are the records organized? This sort of goes back to labeling them from a few minutes ago. Um, do the records appear to be uh, in any kind of formal record series, or are they just all sort of individual and scattered? Are the records clearly labeled? Again, the importance of labeling. Of all of these uh, audiovisual materials, this question is really important. I think people, I sometimes forget to ask it. Which ones are actually records? All right, so what do I mean? A record is any recorded information that is created or received by an agency in connection with the transaction public business and retained as evidence of agency functions, operations, decisions, or activities. Uh, you're going to, you know, want and indeed need to keep um, in accordance with the appropriate records in, in accordance with the appropriate um, retention schedule for local governments, LGS-1, or for state agencies, the general schedule, and any agency-specific records disposition authorizations, or RDAs. But non-records don't need to be kept, and they're only going to confuse the situation. We all know from our houses what visual clutter looks like sometimes, at least, at least I do at my house, and it can be daunting and overwhelming and confusing, and you don't know what you're dealing with. So. You know, non-records are kind of like that. They clutter up, uh, they clutter things up and they make it harder to manage. Again, it could be things like commercial broadcasts. Um, so you want to be on the lookout for that. And they can also be records that are held potentially by other institutions, uh, such as, you know, in our case, sometimes National Archives can have it. Um, so if it exists someplace else, why do you need it? You, maybe you do need it, but you have to ask yourself that question. So I want to stress surveying. Hey, cool. So, when it comes to your inactive records, you want to make sure that you are taking care of them as best possible. The inactive disease is the phase where you have to hold on to them, but 
you don't necessarily use them frequently. You know, you, you may need them for organizational or retention or legal purposes, but you go in and, and address them once every six months, if not longer. So when you're storing those records, you want to make sure that they're in the best condition possible and in the best place possible. So for example, when you're dealing with film, you want to store it in a cool environment. And that's one with you know, a steady temperature and relative humidity that doesn't fluctuate, temperature between 55 and 70 degrees, and a 30, 30 to 55 relative humidity. You, know, you want to make sure that you are keeping them at a nice, stable temperature. You do want to continue to monitor the condition of your media. Um, you know, you walk into your record storage area, you've got a bunch of film in there, and suddenly there is just this toe curling smell. You smell that vinegar. You smell something really, really disturbingly gross. That can be a sign of film degradation or the existence of acetate or nitrate film in your collections. And you're going to want to address that sooner rather than later. You want to look at your media and see, you know, is there anything wrong with it? Is there mold on it? Because it can develop mold. Are the reels, you know, showing signs of uneven tension? So if you lie it flat, you look down the side and there's like little ripples in the, the film pack, that's a sign of uneven tension. The film can get brittle. It can get um, really e easily damaged. So you want to make sure that you're keeping tabs on these things and addressing problems as they're arise, arising and being prepared for them as they come up. One of the things you may want to consider doing for your records is rehouse them if that's the best choice. You know, an example would be if a film reel, is, uh, ha is, you're on a metal reel, you might want to um, replace the core with inert plastic so that it's, you know, in a better condition, in, in a better storage condition, or otherwise making sure that they're in acid-free enclosures. At some point, you may want to consider reformatting. Um, as we've mentioned previously, your AV media, your analog AV media is going to degrade over time. And that's going to adversely affect the quality of the audio and visual video contents on them. So in particular, if these are archival, that should be a priority for formatting. You know, they're starting to get, they're, they're, they're reformatting. They're starting to get a little sketchy. You might want to think about reformatting them at that point. For media that is technically obsolescent or is going out, or if we're, you know, you can't get the, that VHS player anymore, you can't get that Betamax player anymore, and these are records that you need to continue to have access to, you need to consider making that a priority to reformat them to a digital format or another analog format that's going to be viable. If you are looking at digital AV that's getting technically obsolescent. You don't have that QuickTime player anymore. What are you going to do? Um, you need to look at reformatting these records. I cannot stress the importance of doing this because if you wait until it's too late, you are going to end up spending more time and money than you really want to to actually regain access to your records. And you may run the risk of losing access altogether. Okay, everybody, we've reached the last stop, final disposition. Throughout the life cycle, you want to keep your retention schedules in mind, but obviously here, it's especially important. If the records are historical, have been deemed to be historical or archival in your local government, the LGS-1 will indicate permanent retention, and local governments then, you guys are responsible for the preservation. For state agencies, the general schedule or your records disposition authorizations, they'll indicate transfer to state archives. We here at the archives are then responsible for their preser preservation. Um, it's important to identify your historical records. Um, so this is gonna be primarily, because we do that for the state agencies. Uh, we help with the local governments, but you, know, you could come across other stuff. So this is gonna be primarily directed to local governments and uh, non-governmental cultural institutions. Um, you have to decide uh, beyond what's you know, scheduled if you have items that you want to keep forever and make archival or historical. Um, that, you know, answering how to decide what to do, how to do that is a question that could be a presentation of its own, so I'm going to try and get to it quickly. Um, very briefly, abridged version, totally incomplete, but good start. Um, so the first thing to ask is, 
are the records consistent with your institution's mission or with your collection policy? Worked in local government. People try to drop records off with local government archives, and I guess in cultural institutions you face this too, um, all the time. Not all of those records fall with your, within your institution's purview. And if they don't, try and resist the urge or the push, as it may happen, to take them in. Uh, well, let's say you already have them. Ask yourself, do the records depict, a, and this was mentioned a few minutes ago, a government uh, or agency core function or program for cultural institutions? Again, do the records mesh with your mission and collection policy? Next question, is there something about these records um, because they exist as, as an audiovisual medium, is there something about that that makes them special and unique? Sometimes things have to be seen or heard to realize their fullest meaning and significance. Um, an example of something like this, again, go back to it, could be a speech. Yeah, you can read the transcript. That isn't quite the same thing as listening to it or watching it and hearing it. So are the records conveying information in a way that only an AV record could, right? There's some intrinsic value here. Um, and it, can't simply just be reproduced as a transcript or in meeting minutes or something like that. You know, sometimes, because not all speeches are that important, many are not, but maybe they're archival, but you know, not all of them are the Gettysburg Address. You know, maybe you keep it just as a transcript. You have to make that decision. Maybe it's not worth the cost of, you know, constant ongoing permanent management, because that's what you're committing yourself to here, right? If you decide that something's archival or historical, you're responsible for it, in theory, forever. Um, taking this idea of the record's uniqueness, you know, unique's a loaded word, can mean many things, but in this context we also have to ask, are the records the only ones that exist? Do copies exist elsewhere at other institutions or agencies? Are they duplicated? If so, how many copies are out there? If this is a, a record, an a, AV, whatever kind of record, that is, you know, that there are a lot of copies and there are different institutions, maybe you don't need to hang on to it, maybe it's not that unique. What are the formats the records uh, are in? This helps you decide, you know, is the cost or is the record valuable enough um, in terms of its intrinsic value that you want to, or enduring a circle value that you want to pour resources in to reformat it and keep it forever. Um, if they exist in physical media, you, you, that reformatting cost and then migrating them uh, periodically once they're digitized is not insignificant, especially if, especially if you're a small institution or a local government. It can be costly. The condition, same sorts of issues here. Um, if they're, they're worn out, they smell off, uh, you know, you're going to have to reformat them. So again, there's costs associated with that. How well documented are the records, right? If, if you have records that you have a lot of good information on, you know their origin story, you know who's had them, you, you, you know a lot about them, that's really, that's really good and that helps you decide, uh, sort of have mental access into them so you know what you're dealing with so that way you can help in, in, inform your appraisal decision whether or not to make them. Uh, use potential. Are these records that are likely to be used or are they just so obscure that they're likely to sit on a server on a shelf collecting dust? Have to ask yourself that. Costs? Have to ask yourself that as well. Um, Managing these records neither free nor cheap. If you decide that a record is historical or archival, you're committing the institution, again, I can't stress this enough, to its management forever. But hey, no pressure. Seriously though, if you have records that you think may be historic, um, and but you're not exactly sure how to go about determining that, contact State Archives, we can help you figure it out. Um, for just a quick note, just, you know, for records that aren't archival, whether digital or, or analog, um, you have to destroy them. You want to make sure, in the case of digital, in any format, that you destroy them thoroughly and so that confidential information is truly wiped. Um, for physical disposition, uh, for disposition of physical AV records, um, it's, you know, everyone's used to, you know, having people pick up the paper, or waste companies pick up the paper. I would contact your waste company or the company that handles disposal or the vendor and see if they also take AV materials. Some may, some may not. If you run into real trouble with this, don't hesitate to contact us here at the State Archives. Um, final note about that. If you reformat records, consider getting rid of the original. Sometimes people hang on to that original analog for a while. If, uh, if it's in bad shape, if it's starting to uh, smell that vinegar syndrome, <clears throat> uh, once you've reformatted it and digitized it, 
strongly, you know, give consideration to getting rid of it altogether. I'm going to quickly just a few takeaways and conclusions. Uh, I appreciate everyone sticking with us here. Um, you have to actively manage your AV records. You have to be proactive. It can be tedious, it can be annoying, but you must do it. If you don't do it, uh, it will catch up with you and you'll have much bigger headaches later. We've all been there. If you can be proactive, we strongly encourage you to do so. Um, know and understand what you have. Survey, you don't have to sur survey every year, but periodically checking in and making sure that you have really good information on what you have, good intellectual control of your of your holdings, and your records. We encourage you to do that. That's just as true for AV as it is for anything else. Preserve the content. Preserve the information, not the media or the carrier. What matters more than anything else is what's on the carrier or the media, what's, what's inside of it, not that physical thing itself. Related to this, reformat records if and when appropriate. We just went through uh, several different considerations about, um, you know, under what conditions is it, you know, the things you have to consider when reformatting. There are times when records, they might feel really good to hang on to and read or check in with, but they're not necessarily worth reformatting. Um, things that you need to retain for a long time, things that are historic or archival, you have to almost certainly reformat those. Finally, last but not least, place those reformatted, those digitizations or born digital records that you have to keep, place them in a trusted digital repository. Get them on your local area network, get them on a cloud server, speak with, use your IT department. That's what they're there for. Work with them hand in hand here to determine what that trusted digital repository is. Okay, if you have any questions, let me give you some contact info here, and I can hang around for a while. I realize this went a little bit over because we had some technical difficulties, but Sarah and I are here for you. If you're a local government or state agency, there's our email, and for non-government institutions, there's the Documentary Heritage Program contact as well. Thank you. Yeah, I do apologize for that, guys. My um, headset decided to make itself obsolete in the middle of my presentation. <laughs> Well, we're glad to have you back, Sarah, and uh, and thank you both. Uh, we do have a few questions. I wanted to let folks know before they log off, um, if you had more than one person at your location participating in this webinar, if you could just type in the number into the chat box. So if it's just you, don't worry about it, but if you had two, three, four, 25 people, that would be helpful to for us to know uh, what our audience size was like. So let's see, we got uh, a few questions here from Elias. Um, uh, he asked, and this is kind of early on, so, um, but will, he asked, um, would you be able to suggest proper methods of presenting analog media on digital formats in a low budget environment? And I don't know if you covered that, but maybe you could speak to that. Run that one more time, Rich. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, suggest proper methods of presenting analog media on digital formats in a low budget environment. So, are we talking about conversion of audio uh, uh, of analog formats to digital? Um, in in that case, I mean, it's going to be it, it's the cost is going to depend very much on the media that you're trying to convert and how long it is and the, it, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, so you really are going to want to consult with a vendor to do the work because you're probably not going to want to buy the equipment yourself to do it. Right, and, and be selective. Um, I've seen situations where um, you know, people before they you know really have thought about it, they just dive in head first and get quotes for you know digitizing everything. Seen this paper certainly. Um, you know, vendors will do that gladly, right? May not need to digitize everything. So being very selective, um, especially when you don't have a, a, a lot of money, frankly, um, is is your best bet. But I agree with Sarah. Beyond that. Um, 
go to the vendor and, and coordinate with them. I think investing in your own equipment is would be very challenging. Okay, Greg uh, asked, he said, uh, if not part of the presentation, can you include discussion on records retention and best practices for AV files related to recorded public meetings hosted by cloud solutions, such as Zoom, YouTube, Teams, et cetera, during the pandemic? So you're probably going to want to evaluate those for their historical value, honestly. Um, Public meetings have a, I believe, four-month retention, four retention after they've been transcribed and turned into minutes. Um, but because this is a historic event that we are currently in the midst of, um, they may have long-term research value and, and some intrinsic value associated with them. So you're, going, you're, you're really going to want to approach these records and determine whether or not they have long-term historical value. Okay, Elias asked, are secure storage, quote unquote, secure storage, a dilemma for non-proprietary software use? Can you run that one again, Rich? Sure. He asks, uh, are secure storage a dilemma for non-proprietary software, the use of non-proprietary software? I'm not entirely certain where you're going with it. I'm 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 going to apologize for that right now, um, because I mean, secure storage of, of your records should protect all of the records that you're going to going to put in them, regardless of the proprietary or non-proprietary format of the records. It's when somebody gets in there and they have access to the files that problems can can occur. Um, you know, non-proprietary formats, because typically that information is more widely spread, widely available as to what what makes up those formats. Yeah, it does increase the vulnerability with regard to you know malicious activities, but it, you you really do have to weigh the risks of, of whether or not the um, the the risk of having a proprietary format that isn't going to be supported is worth it against the accessibility of the pro non proprietary format. Okay, I hope that and, helps. Okay, and uh, another question here by Elias: When keeping content that is not original, should it be filed with a notarized certification of authentication? Um, I'm not sure where that. What I I don't think that would be necessary. Okay. And uh, okay, so Tara asks, what are the ideal temperature and humidity, humidity levels for analog audiovisual materials? Okay, so we're looking at um, 55 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit and a 30 to 55 degree relative humidity. Okay, uh, Holly asks, is there an archively preferred format for digital AV files? I've been using MP4. Um, there isn't one in particular um, that, that I am aware of, uh, but I, let me let us look into that for you. Um, MP4 should be should should have some some long term sustainability at this point. But um, if you send us an email, we can we can give you better information. Yeah, with yeah. a little little digging into that, we could probably see what people are out there using for that and give you a halfway decent answer. Sure. And again, we've got our uh, emails up there uh, on the screen. So for local governments and state agencies, you can email recmgmt at niced.gov. And for non-governmental cultural institutions, dhs at niced.gov. And uh, not getting any other questions at this point in time. Uh, so we are a few minutes uh, over, but we still have a few, a few, a few minutes. But again, uh, if you have any questions, you can email us, and we will get, uh, we will get you an answer. Okay. Um, yeah. So at this point in time, it looks like, uh, looks like we don't have any other questions. All right. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Yeah, thank you for having. Or thank you for attending today. Thanks, everyone.